So Sam, it's more than two years since you let go of the reins at IBM. Jordan, that time you founded the Center for Global Enterprise, which is where we're sat today. What are its aims? Well, basically, the, the goal of the Center for Global Enterprise is to help prepare future leaders that are operating in this newly globally integrated world that's only begun. Right. I mean, some people say we're 10 or 20 percent of our way on, a, on our way to a long journey. Mm -hmm. uh, if that is the case, uh, what is the management system that's required? How do you get young people that are entering the workforce to be prepared for the environment they're going to be managing in? How do you prepare the people, the next generation of CEOs through executive programs to have a sense and a comprehension of what the world they're going to be managing in? So that's the primary goal is to advance the management thinking. And in terms of thinking, and you've recently written an e-book, um, Rethink a Path to the Future. Now in that you talk a lot about the importance of openness and open technology, open ways of thinking. What sort of open technologies in the world today do you think are particularly applicable to the new global economy? Well, I think if you go back, I think if you have a little sense of what's happened in globalization to date, it kind of sets the stage for the future. Mm -hmm. And if you go back, what happened to accelerate the emerging markets were two macro factors. One is governments, for whatever sets of reasons, decided they needed to now engage the global economy for growth to improve the standard of the living of their societies. Maybe they were closed economies before, but they went through a philosophical change, maybe not an ideological change, but philosophical change. At the same time, what you had going on was this big broadband capacity called the Internet that was established around the world on an open standard, Internet protocols, and you were able to exchange information primarily because of things like Microsoft Word, which was in a way a de facto standard for document exchange. So you had this now interconnected world where information and data could flow, uh, a lot of it was open sourced in the sense of data structures and Linux and those kinds of things. At the same time that markets were opening up and as they engaged the global economy, their skilled people were now entering into a global workforce. So that's where we kind of began. Uh, today actually it's even more accelerated because if you take the factors, what do you still have? More and more countries are still trying to deal with their issues of how they engage in a global economy. Most of the growth is outside of the G7 today. Most of the world's population is outside of the G7 today. And the standards are every bit as important. The standards today have moved beyond just connectivity, the network, to data standards, big data analysis, cloud computing as an alternative to really robust horizontal infrastructure that's more affordable so problems can be solved that weren't solved heretofore. So the technology is advanced, um, and at the same time, the countries now are looking for innovation models, not just, I'll call it, low-cost manufacturing or low-cost labor models. So, I mean, when you talk about these countries, I mean, we, you know, there's so much development work in areas like China, but also, as we're seeing this week in the news, there's also a lot of challenges around issues such as cybersecurity. So on the one hand, businesses are dealing with these technological challenges, but they also need to deal with these broader political in issues that are between countries, say, this week. It's a spat between the United States and, and the Chinese government. Kind of, what advice would you give to businesses that are looking to navigate that sort of technological and political right. minefield? Well, the most important advice I, I give a business leader, which I used to always give myself, do not get in the middle of a fight between two countries, okay? Especially the number one economy in the world and the number two economy in the world. So if you can avoid being their example, good or bad, try to avoid being their example because it puts you in a situation as a company that basically is trying to solve client problems, work with customers, do good things for society, improve the educational standards, let's say. It puts you in a position which is an awkward position that you should try to avoid. And does this mean, as IBM CEO, you talked about the whole notion of IBM and its American identity, and you felt that that, that kind of became less of an issue as IBM's importance in indigenous markets right. grew. I mean, is that the same issue that you're talking about? Well, you about? have to connect. When yeah. I talk about in the, in the book, as they say, you, you know, and you have to uh, optimize globally, but you have to execute locally. And by that I mean by execute locally, of course you have to sell locally because people are on the ground, but you have to connect with local society. You have to be able to build trust. You need permission to operate in those societies. You need permission of governments to allow you to operate. And the best way to do that is to connect with their societal priorities. That's education, it could be sustainability, smarter planets, smarter cities in our case, connected in that dimension. 
But you need to, I believe in today's environment, you have to connect. Why? Because you need to have established trust. If for whatever sets of reasons, you as a foreign entity trying to participate in wherever it happens to be, and IBM is 170 places, or 169 behind the United States, you need to have local trust, uh, and you have to work hard at building that local trust.